All right, we are live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. I have with me Sam Parker here today back on. Hi, Sam. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good. Good to have you on. We uh, are recording this just after the new update. Michigan governor said that we're going to extend our quarantine isolation uh, for until the end of April. A lot of people were not. That's not what they wanted to hear. Um, and uh, so today, Sam and I are going to discuss quarantine fitness, right? Sam, you're a CrossFit gym owner. If people haven't uh, didn't watch the lot last podcast with you when you told your story about transitioning from the military and how that led to personal training and then to owning a CrossFit gym, uh, you guys should watch that. It's really good. Really good story. A lot of takeaways, especially if you're in the fitness community. And um, so Sam accepted my invite to come on, and for he's been leading and organizing some some stuff for his community. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. So Sam, thanks for coming on. No, thanks for uh, letting me come back again. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So what a, what have you been doing as a gym owner during this time? this quarantine time yeah it's it's been a little rough for a lot of small businesses especially uh gyms but um like i I told all of our members and we try to stay connected with them as much as possible uh it's obvious that we won't be able to work out the gym together you know for the next couple weeks at least or in the past couple weeks also so to use this kind of uh this time as an opportunity um to work on your fitness, but also kind of the foundational movements, which I think the body weight movements are a foundational uh, building block when it comes to any overall fitness. Um, if you can't air squat right, then you probably shouldn't be back squatting. Um, you know, if you can't do a push up correctly, perhaps you shouldn't do a bench press or a strict press or something like that. So I think this is an, uh, an opportunity, an awesome time, an opportunity to kind of get back to basics and work on those foundational movements um, that sometimes in the CrossFit community, we get, uh, we fall in love with the snatch and the ring muscle ups and kind of all these uh, sexier forms of exercises and the, uh, the body weight movements are sometimes overshadowed by uh, these other um, weighted exercises or fancier flashy exercises. So I think it's a great opportunity to get back to the basics. Yeah, that's, it's funny just yesterday. So in my normal routine, uh, and if you guys, I post on it, I post it on social media. So if you're like interested in what I do for actual training for like, um, for my long range, uh, rocking and such, you can check that out. But I do a primary, a heavy lift. So I'll do my warm up, and then I'll do 10 sets of two reps of a heavy barbell lift. Um, and I do that on the minute, every minute for 10 minutes. And then So that's like my foundation strength, right? So I got deadlift. I got power clean. I have a low ceiling in my little gym basement here. So I have to do like from the knee shoulder press um, and things like that. And uh, so that's what I normally do. And then I I do like isolated muscle movements, very old school, right? With whatever I have in my basement. But I've started to change my mindset a bit, right? Um, Because you got vertical plane of motion. You got horizontal plane of motion. And then you have trans plane, right? And I was, I was watching uh, Joe Rogan interview. um, Oh crap. What's his name? He's like that Delta force guy with the beard. He's like Pat Mack. I watched his interview with Pat Mack and he was talking about the, the importance of trans plane movement. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to start working that in. So I started some new things. I got my bands out here. Everybody's hot with the bands right now because of quarantine. So I've been doing some stuff with the bands, but I took a kettlebell and I did this movement where I was standing and I had a kettlebell on one side and I sort of threw it over and above the opposite shoulder Mm -hmm. and stopped it. And I'm trying to like stabilize all my core the whole core, like uh, pelvis and abs and everything uh, to keep myself from moving. And I just, I was sort of isolating this movement with this like 20 pound kettlebell and like stopping it over my shoulder and bringing it back down. And I like, I did six sets of it. Cause I was like, Oh, this is doing something in my, in my back in between mm-hmm. my shoulder blades on one side, my weaker side, I've like pulled a muscle that I didn't oh, know yeah. was there. This like super small muscle. And what I'm fine. And so now it's like, 
uh, it sucks today, but <laughs> that's, that's what I'm finding, man. Like you talked about these like foundational movements or these like small movements you wouldn't really think about as I'm trying to hit them up, I'm finding little weak areas, mm-hmm. right? I'm finding these little weak areas and like even my deep air squats and stuff, they don't, it's like, oh, so not, yeah, I'm like becoming more aware of some of my, uh, my weak spots. Yeah, the, the transverse plane, uh, you kind of moving that rotational exercises are um, uh, underutilized for sure. Um, and it's kind of interesting too, because if you go and you look at, um, you know, if you worked at a warehouse or something like that, and you're having to move heavy boxes, you're having to lift and turn. And a lot of the times they tell you, you know, you don't lift and turn and kind of move at the same time, which, yeah, it's understandable that could cause you to get hurt. But in reality, that's what you do on a daily basis. I mean, you're always going to have to lift things and move things, and there's going to be some rotation. You want to do it correctly, but you can't just, uh, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater there. And be like, well, you could get hurt when you're rotating and turning and lifting something, but it's like, well, if I can get hurt doing it, perhaps I should work on it, you know? So, yeah, the tr- transverse plane is, is one that's um, – I would say even in CrossFit is uh, kind of, uh, there's not too many movements that we do that go through those kind of planes. A lot of stuff's kind of the frontal plane, maybe the sagittal plane, but yeah, the transverse is definitely a, uh, um, an overlooked area, but very important because it's daily life. Yeah. CrossFit is really strong in that like compound movement though. That's kind of where you guys live, isn't it? Like these really compound exercises that just get a lot of stuff. Yeah, and, and that's the idea of like kind of the CrossFit's definition. Um, part of the definition of functional movement is um, kind of exercise that you use more than one joint, you know, so a compound lift or a compound movement, but something that um, usually starts from the hips and kind of flows from there. So there's a kind of a lot of different ways to define functional, but using multiple joints for one exercise is, is, a, is a big aspect of CrossFit. So what have you been doing for, you've been doing uh, daily wads and posting them on social media, right? And so your mm-hmm. CrossFit community sees that and they can, which is really cool. I've shared it with some family members, right? I have a sister of mine. She's uh, in the training for the Paralympic swim team. So she lives mm-hmm. out in Colorado, right? Uh, real cool little side caveat. Everybody that's on the Paralympic teams or the, or the U.S. para teams, um, outstanding they're all they're all kids right they're all like 22 and younger but all of them have these like amputations or other forms of like serious uh physical limitation but they all have these hearts of gold and they're all great individuals and they all have huge hearts i'm always impressed anytime i meet her her teammates but yeah that's awesome yeah yeah but she's like restricted to her room the whole olympic training (laughs) center is shut down right and the olympic games are closed Yep. Right, they're pushed back. So now all these the best some of the best athletes in the United States, the whole training facility is shut down. The gym is shut down. The pools are shut down. They have to just stay in their rooms and wow. get fat. You know they're going to eat like they always do, right? Yeah. It's going to crush calories. She swims for like you know more than three hours a day normally, so she just crushes calories. So they're oh, all yeah. doing she's nothing. Probably, she's probably burning three to five thousand calories a day. Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. She's just a monster. So, um, I actually linked her to your posts. Awesome. She was like, what are some resources that I could do? And you were, your posts were the first thing that I thought of. So I like tagged you in that. It's funny because today I work out of the day. We are working a little bit of some rotational exercises. Um, and there was some kettlebells and dumbbells. So it's, it's kind of funny that you brought that up because, uh, that's one area that I have been trying to hit more now that, um, things are limited. So you can kind of work in these things that you haven't, haven't done or haven't used a lot lately. So it's an opportunity. What are some, what are some advantages? So you're talking about like hitting up these basic foundational movements, you know, why is that so important and why do you think that it doesn't really get hit when we're, when we can do whatever we want? (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, they are, they are basic and, you know, to a certain extent, uh, basic can sometimes be uh, thought to be as boring. Um, So, it's not as maybe not as fun um, because it's not as new to people. Um, But just, you know, I I actually put, uh, we started a little test of mine that we did uh, a couple weeks ago 
uh, where I had everybody do um, kind of this little body weight test they came up with. So it's a one max effort set of pull-ups to see how many pull-ups you could do. Pull-ups are a great exercise. Um, that's honestly the Marine Corps, like their pull-up portion for their PT test. I think that's great. Um, push-ups are a great exercise. That's another one. But with a pull-up, you're moving your whole body weight. With a push-up, perhaps maybe 60 to 70% of your body weight. So that you're missing out on some of your actual body weight where a pull-up, you're supporting the whole entire thing. Uh, so I love the pull-up. So we did a max effort set of pull-ups. Um, so as many as you could possibly do. And then we did a one minute test of as many um, uh, push-ups as you could do. One minute test of as many air squats you could do. One minute test of as uh, many sit-ups as you could do. And then a one mile run. Um, so oh, it's like it a, a nice PFT. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of my version of uh, um, my foundational, what I would like to see as a, a kind of a foundational PT test that uh, um, it's nothing crazy. It covers a lot of areas um, and it's all body weight movements. Um, so you can kind of judge where you are and where you should be focusing your training on by how well you did in certain one of these events. Pull-ups are no joke, man. Pull-ups are a strong movement. If you can, the Marine Corps max is 20 if you can do yeah. 20 in two minutes i think it's two minutes but usually it's like how long you can be on the bar and yeah. but yeah you gotta be you gotta be strong to do a lot of pull-ups i've always struggled with pull-ups i think it's because i tend to be a little heavier i uh, i don't know i don't know but i've always had a hard time with pull-ups push-ups are easier push-ups yeah. are easier and you know push-ups are great too i just i think for the pull-up it's just a you're, you're moving your whole body weight so i mean it's a it's a it's a real solid test of how well that you can control your body and move your body. Um, mm. There's obviously more to it, but I just, I think a pull up is a great test. Um, Cause if you can get a big guy, like think of like a like an offensive lineman from a football team and that guy can hop up there and do five pull ups, like strict pull ups. That's impressive. That's a big um, deal. Yeah. So, you know, if you get that same, that same lineman to be able to knock out, you know, 50 push-ups in a minute. It's like, oh yeah, that's impressive. But to me, the five pull-ups um, would be much more of an impressive feat than in that way. But it's yeah, that's cool. But then again, to your point also that you mentioned earlier, kind of the um, you know you get the vertical horizontal plane. So with the pull-up, you know we're pulling, so it's kind of a vertical pull. And then with a the push-up, you're pushing, so it's a horizontal push. Um, usually, or you can might term that vertical, but usually I term it more of a, a horizontal push. Um, so you're getting that different push pull for the upper body. And then when you talk about running the same thing, running is really more of a pull with your legs than a push, but then you got the squats, the air squats, which is a pushing movement. And then the sit-ups is just kind of a, a, an abdominal movement, um, kind of test core strength, but honestly, it's not probably the best test of core strength, but it's a, it's a good one to start with. Talking about core strength. So I have a theory on core strength, right? So a lot of people look at core strength and they look at, there's two aspects to it. One is this like, um, like horizontal movements. I'm laying on the ground or I'm doing in a push-up position and like the different kind of movements that you can do and the reps that you can get out of that. The other one is uh, vertical stabilization. So core assisting in all your heavy lifts, compound movements more in my case and your case too, because you're also training for rucking events as well, um, is uh, rucking, right? Yes. Or uh, long distance weight bearing. There's a lot of, that's all, uh, that's all core and pelvis and glutes. And uh, so I've had to revise my thinking. I actually don't do horizontal uh, abdominal movements anymore. I, I don't yeah. do it anymore. I think that, well, what happened was in high school, I was getting ready for the Marine Corps, right? And so I was doing P90X. Mm. That was when it was hot. My dad yeah. got it and never used it. And I like found the <laughs> DVD set and I'm like, I'm doing this in the garage. So I set up a little gym thing in the garage. Well, I did that and I loved the ab day. So I was doing it like every day and I just, so I got really strong abs. But what I didn't do is I didn't, do compound core and I didn't do lower back. Mm. So now I have a really strong abdominal structure, but I have a weak lower back structure. And that gave me, and that continued, I trained that way for years, right? Cause that's, you keep doing what you learned when you first mm -hmm. learned it. 
by habit. So I did that for years. And now that I've become more educated, I've learned how much that's actually limited me in my athleticism and how now I have like some compression in my lower discs, right? And some other problems that could have been avoided if I had tackled my core strengthening differently. Now I don't even do uh, horizontal abdominal movements because I am sport specific in my training, but I do like the trans plane. Um, I'll do all these movements where I feel like I have to flex my whole body and flex my core because my ultimate fear is that I'll be rucking and I'll do something and then I'm going to hurt my back. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I'm under load and I have poor form on my clean or my deadlift. And then I, which is what happened last year, I had poor form and I hurt my lower back and it put me out of deadlifts for like three weeks and I lost a lot of strength. Um, so now everything is like injury prevention and endurance. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of maybe that P90X thing. It's funny. Uh, it's probably this like fixation, like we're human beings and we like to look good. I mean, that's just kind of like what it is. And your eyes are in the front part of your head. And when you look in the mirror, you look at the front part. So everybody wants those glistening abs. Everybody wants to look good in the front part. That's why chest day is the famous, everybody's favorite day in the gym. Because you're working on that front part. It's the back part. Um, that in the long run will be more beneficial for you. That lower back strength, the glute strength, the hamstring strength, the lat strength, the upper back strength, um, just for supporting anything. Um, you're going to need the front part to be strong too, but yeah, absolutely to your point. I mean, you got to, that's an imbalance. So one side's really strong, the other side's really weak. Um, so, you know, hitting both sides to make sure that you're having a, a nice, stable body to which support weight, which support a ruck, is make sure the front side and back side are equal. Yeah. And uh, going back to transplane motion. So what are some, what are some movements that you'll do or that you would recommend people doing in this quarantine fitness time that we're in uh, that would support like, well, let's talk about both. Let's talk about transplane. Let's talk about like longevity, right? Which is, um, hitting those foundations and injury prevention, which are things that I'm looking at and learning about right now. So teach me, Sam, how can I keep from becoming decrepit? What can I do right now during quarantine fitness? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think the first thing that I think people have to kind of get into their head is the fitness they do. They want that to support their lifestyle, not infringe upon their lifestyle. Um, I myself, you know, get involved in something and you push really hard, you're really hard, really hard, really hard. And it's okay to get sore, but we want to make sure that what we're doing fitness wise is benefiting our lifestyle and not making it worse and, and you know, moving something wrong or doing too much of something and kind of hurting yourself. So again, kind of like foundationally, we have this time to work on our body weight movements and then adding load in there, the kettlebell, it's a great, a great tool and a dumbbell and doing single arm movements. So like today we did some single leg um, RDLs with a dumbbell or a kettlebell. So you're standing on one leg, holding the kettlebell or the dumbbell in one leg and going down and touching the floor with that weight and bringing it back up on one leg. So you're working the unilateral part of it by working on your balance, working on one side. Um, Cause if we do have imbalances, when we use a barbell or we use something that's both hands are attached to, one side can take over from the other. So it's always a good idea to mix in some single hand, single leg movements. Um, that way you're getting both sides to get their own um, part of the movement and they're working on themselves. Um, so like single leg deadlifts, um, or single hand, single leg, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, you know, with the kettlebell, doing some kettlebell snatches, dumbbell snatches. So these are single arm movements again. Um, they're explosive but they're also working on one side. And while you're working, while you're holding the heavy weight on one side, the other side of your core or your back or your abs or whatever you want to term it is working also. Mm. Um, so single arm movements, single leg movements. Um, you know, you can start with pistols, which are a single leg squat. If you can do those. Uh, pistols are hard. It. Yes. Yeah, they yeah. are. It's, it's, it's a, you know, and, and that's kind of the foundational um, progress and the steps that you can take. You can work on your air squat. You can get good at your air squat, and then you can start working on pistols. So you're still doing a single 
or you're still doing a foundational body weight movement, but now you're advancing along and getting better at it. And it's only going to help you in the long run. So you, if like, uh, we talked about on the last episode that you were on your infantry vet, right. And you're a firefighter, you're a volunteer firefighter. And, you know, Pat talked about like trans movement, transplane, uh, being where you win fights and also how you save lives. Yes. So, and you yeah. talked about supporting your lifestyle too. So if you're a professional where you make your money off of your body, right? Uh, how would you, how would that tailor your training plan? Because you obviously want to force your body to adapt. You want to get better at your job, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you still have to do your job, right? Yeah. So you want to talk about that? Yeah. And again, you hit the nail on the head there. And I consider and try to get this um, when I train firefighters and police officers and military people is the idea that you're a semi-professional athlete. You're paid to run, you're paid to jump, you're paid to lift, you're paid to carry, you're paid, paid, paid to drag, to do all these things. You're, that's what your job is. There's other things on top of that. But physically, you're a semi-professional athlete because if you can't do those things, well, then you can't do your job. Um, and yeah, it is a huge thing because if you look at um, athletes, so if you say semi-professional athlete, um, an athlete has a season. And it's easier to train when you have a known season. So, you know, this is the preseason, um, this is in season, this is post season, this is off season. So it's very easy to write a plan, a cycles or cycles to go into that. But in this tactical athletic kind of semi-professional athlete world, I mean, you have really no off season. You're expected to be uh, in season all the time. So that is, it's important to push yourself and get better, but it's also important to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and you're doing things that are going to make you um, have more longevity in your field. So it's, it's a very hard line to kind of, kind of balance, but in that you can create your own seasons, your own off seasons and your own cycles that help you still get better, but then you're taking the proper time to make sure that you're not just slamming on top of yourself and, and trying to do too much and then eventually hurting yourself because you're doing too much. So, you know, as, as much as a tactical athlete has to be on all the time, um, you have to build it in so that you are working different movements. You are working unilateral movements. You're working in a transverse plane because that's where a lot of the stuff's going to happen as a firefighter, as a police officer, as, you know, as a um, military member. So working all those sides, building up, and again, starting from that foundational level, starting with good body weight movements and good form, and then moving that up into weighted exercises, into using barbells and the kettlebells and dumbbells and sleds and all these other things that are so much fun, but really starting at the beginning and making sure that your push up squared away, you got some pull ups, you know, you squat well, you got a good mile time, um, you know, kind of in those areas um, to start with first. but push through it and, and make your plan and your cycles progressive and then take your time off too. Yeah. That's the, so I'm thinking like, I'm thinking about myself. If I was myself a few years ago and I was a lot, I was very ignorant, right? Like I've been very blessed to meet some terrific and influential people like yourself that are great and talented athletes and are very knowledgeable. So I'm thinking about myself like a few years ago before I started expanding my thought process and expanding my mind about fitness. And all I was doing was running and lifting old school. Same thing since I played football in high school. Right. And now I'm in quarantine and I have no tools and I, I don't have any of the things that I used to know. I think my mindset's a little different. And I think yours is and guys like me and you, because uh, we are part of the generation that went overseas in the military and we had the ghetto gyms that were made from sandbags and you know jugs of water and whatever and so we know how to like and it's fun and it's cool to like i think it's cool to make this ghetto gem and just make it happen that just appeals to me uh but if i was like now i'm forced out of my rut and now i'm and this just got extended and we're not the only state that's going to the end of April in quarantine. Other guys are too. And you've already had like a couple weeks off. Now is never is a great time 
to revisit the fundamentals for all the reasons that you talked about and to do those body weight movements. And like I just did yesterday and today, find your weak areas, right? Find your weak areas and start addressing those things. Why am I weak in pull-ups? Maybe like this thing that I did to my back is related to why I'm weak in pull-ups. You know, I'm good in push-ups. I can keep working on that, but I'm, I'm bad at pull-ups. I need to figure out why. I need to figure out why, you know, why can't I, why would I have trouble with pistol squats? You know, and then another thing that's overlooked in my mind is recovery, Right. My older mindset, let's talk about recovery a little bit. My older mindset about recovery was um, is just sleeping, right? Oh, make sure I get enough sleep, make sure I eat good food. But now um, I'm getting older and I'm training harder. I'm in the best shape that I've ever been in my life, right? That's and great. Yeah, thank you. And I'm training harder. I need new tools. So I've been learning about a new method. So I got a foam roller. I should do a, a YouTube episode about the different things that I found that I really like. But I got a foam roller that I use. It's perfect. I have some hot spots on my legs that get really worn out by rocking and like my lifts. So I make sure to hit those. And when I do, I'm stronger on my deadlifts, right? Mm -hmm. I hit those spots first. I get stronger. I can bend better. I'm more malleable. Uh, I have the so at the so right thing. You ever seen that? Oh, thing? you did? Yeah, oh, I got that awesome. thing. If you don't know what a so right is, it's this like plastic U shaped thing and lays on the ground, and you can hit your uh, so as with it, which is like inside your hips and your lower abs. It's a deep, deep hip flexor. <laughs> yes, very deep. And it was, it has that tool has changed my life literally because I had this. I would stretch all the time and I had all this lower back pain, but it was actually my, my psoas was tight and it was so hard to hit. And it's the same story for a lot of fighters and a lot of other guys um, who have some pretty serious lower back pain. So that tool changed my life. And then the last thing, and I got the little one too. It's, I got the little mini oh, one yeah, that yeah. you hold in your that. hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm gonna, when the quarantine's over, I'm going to have to try that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll have you over. We can hang out in the home gym. We'll, we'll try out some stuff. Nice. Um, so those have, been, those have been great. So like myofascial release and stuff. Um, absolutely key component now that I'm in heading into my 30s and in my fitness life. Yeah, recovery is a huge thing. Um, one, one of my friends... Uh, he used to say, it's like, if you're sore, you can't train the next day. It's not that you overtrained, you just under recovered. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, uh, maybe that's an oversimplic oversimplification of it, but uh, there's a lot of things that you can do to make sure that you're ready to go the next day. You know, stretching, using a foam roller, or using a lacrosse ball, sleep, that's a huge one too. Um, uh, huge uh free recovery and making sure you're eating and drinking enough it, it's kind of uh all works together getting to sleep nutrition and then making sure that you are stretching you are working on some mobility you are making yourself uh, more flexible um and working on those areas that you know you need to work on so maybe like pistols that might be a tough one for you for a lot of people uh pistol squats um, take a lot of ankle mobility. So you have to have a lot of flexion in your ankle. And if you don't, a lot of times that's from your calves or your anterior tib. But there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, so I'm always a big proponent, maybe it's because I'm simple, as I like to work on kind of like one thing at a time. So like, hey, you know, like my, and I said not one thing at a time, but my main focus, like, hey, for this month, I'm going to really work on my psoas. I'm going to really work on my hip flexors. I'm going to really work on my calves and make sure every time that I run, when I get done, I'm rolling out my calves. I'm rolling out the bottom of my feet. I'm doing all the right stuff. Because when I do all the right stuff, like afterwards, I feel good. And when I slip on it, that's when like, it doesn't happen right away. But like two weeks later, that's when a little tweak or this happens or this happens. It's because I didn't stay on top of it. So yeah, it's one thing that you have to do. If you're going to work out, you need to recover. Um, if you want to continue to work out, that's simple. Yeah. It's, have you ever done an ice bath? I have. Yeah. What do you yes. think of cryo for recovery? I've never done that. Um, or I guess just getting just the ice bath, like the cold, yeah, the cold it, thing in general. It definitely has some um, 
good properties to it. There's certain things that like icing can be good and can be bad. Um, a lot of the times with like, for me personally, when I have joints that are sore or anything like that, um, I don't like to ice them um, because that constricts your blood vessels. And I want blood and I want nutrients and I want oxygen to get to those joints and work on it. So for me, for certain things, I won't really ice them or do things. But like the ice bath thing, I did, <laughs> the first time I did an ice bath was after the uh, um, Baton Death March. So I'm like, I'll oh. do this and like, I'll be like, you know, I won't be sore the next day and like, okay, whatever. But uh, yeah, you got to be careful with those because you can't make it super cold and jump in. Supposedly, I didn't know this, but you're supposed to get in it and then slowly start making it cold. Because um, as men, you can get some uh, shock going on there that oh. you really want to happen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've done those before. And for like certain things, I think they're great. Um, but like I said, other things, I don't necessarily ice because uh, I want the blood to get there. Mm. Good thoughts. Yeah, there's a lot of good information out there about it. Uh, you know what? I talking about recovery. I have had things where so right now uh, I work part time security at a hospital. And it's a really interesting time because I'm doing this during the quarantine, right? So we've been having people, businesses, bakeries, restaurants, dropping off tons of food for all the staff in the hospital. And you're like, oh, cool. So it'll be like Panera and you'll get like green goddess salad and some sandwiches, which is nice. But like half of it, man, is like pizza oh, yeah. and donuts <laughs> and cake. And in my house, I did, we don't just we just don't buy junk food. Right. And so I never have to practice this willpower because it's always like, okay, this is my meal for today. It's tomorrow. Here's, there's no willpower exercise for like junk food. And I don't go out very much. But out there, I it's I crush donuts. I crush cake. They're I crush delicious. Pizza. That's why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just Not did. Fair. They taste so good. I know. And I, I just did two days or two nights straight, 12-hour shifts, and I ate wow. like crap both chefs and I had energy drinks of both chefs. And I tell you what, it makes me sick for like four or five days afterwards. Like my, I slog through my workouts. I'm not as fit. I don't recover well. I'm way more sore this week than I am usually. And I know it happens every time and I always forget. Um, but when I go back and I eat junk food, even for just a couple of days, it throws off my whole body's system and ability to recover and my performance for days afterwards. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're putting, if you're eating well and doing anything like a race car, you, you got, you know, that high octane fuel you're putting in there and then you take that race cars fuel away and then you put the regular, you know, 87 uh, octane in there. Um, it's not going to be the same. Um, it's just not, you know, and that's a, that's a huge thing about what you're, what you're putting in your mouth and kind of what you're enjoying. I, I mean, I, I like to have sweets like occasionally and I like to have like, you know, for me, that's like, it makes living fun, but it's definitely one of those things that it's, you can just fall off, <laughs> you know, <laughs> spend, especially now spending like two days, you know, just eating junk food in a row. It'll catch up to you, but you can, you can push through it. That's the thing is like, yeah, two bad days, but in three, four days, you'll be back on the train. You'll be hitting, you know, you'll be feeling great. You'll be feeling back to where you were. So I try not to make people stress too much about it. It's like, yeah, okay. You had a bad day, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's going to take you two days to get rid of that bad day. But when you do, you're still back on it. So it's never just because I think sometimes people, when they get on a diet or they try something and they get frustrated because they have a bad day or two and then they're like, let it go. It's like, no, don't let it go. Like, yeah, you had a bad day and bad two days, whatever. Just keep pushing, keep moving forward, keep being consistent. and. Uh, yeah, you'll gain much more progress that way than by giving up. What do, what do you think about dieting or diets in general? Because a lot of uh, that's pretty common in CrossFit community, right? A lot of guys do paleo. It's probably the yeah. most common thing in CrossFit, right? What do yeah. you think about that sort of stuff? I think it's great. Um, I'm a very, um, I think it's the diet should be like specific to the person. Um, so like for paleo, like usually the first thing they have you do is like the, um, 30 day challenge or what's it called? whole 30. So you eat like really clean for 30 days. And the idea is after that 30 days is you start bringing back 
things into your diet and you're testing them out and you're seeing what works for you because we all have different you know gut issues like personally i like milk doesn't agree with me so i know i i don't drink milk i can't because it bothers me but occasionally i have ice cream and i enjoy it but if i had too much of it i had it two days in a row i'd be paying for it so you know like doing the whole 30 things and, and the paleo things is great but i think you can add other things into that too then maybe that other diets or maybe they paleo wouldn't be a true paleo diet. So if you were, you know, 90% paleo, but you still had rice or you still, you know, occasionally you had some pasta or something like that. I think as long as those things don't bother you and don't have like a negative effect on how you feel, then it's all right to eat it. Yeah. That is a very good mindset to have, right? Rather than just going into a diet and like sticking with it, but rather like stepping back, letting your gut reset and then going into it and figuring out what works best for you. It's so, it's so prevalent. I wonder if there's like, because of all the chemicals and stuff that we eat, I wonder if it's messing up American gut biomes. Cause I feel like all of my friends have some sort of dietary restriction. Like everybody does like, and that didn't happen 10 years ago. These people weren't, lactose intolerant and gluten dairy free 10 years ago. But now it like even myself, I have, I, I used to like have like two gallons of whole milk a week, like just tons of milk. Now I have, I've dropped milk. Uh, we oh, have yeah. this unsweetened almond milk, but I can't drink milk anymore. I'm like, it's, it sucks. Cause I like it with my protein. Cause it makes it like a shake, but I yeah, just it can't have better. it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, but if people that can, you know, people can drink milk and it doesn't bother them, they don't have a, you know, side effects to it, they don't have gut issues, it doesn't, um, you know, they don't have a huge insulin spike with it, and they don't feel really slow or lethargic afterwards. If if, it fe if you feel fine and milk is good for you, like, and it doesn't bother you, my personal opinion is, yeah, drink it, that's fine. But if it does have an issue with you, it's your body telling you something that, hey, <laughs> this is just not made for you. Mm. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I'm learning so much about that now. Like gut is like a new category that I'm starting to learn about and understand like biotics, how it work. I learned a lot of fasting. Fasting is just like fantastic for you. Mm -hmm. it's so good. I'm like to do these like 18 hour fasts about like once a week, but I, I really want to hit like just like a, like a three day fast because it looks like it would be awful, right? Just like seventy two hour <laughs> I think fast that would be awful. Reset everything, um, but yeah. you re you reset your whole microbial system mm -hmm. and your whole and I body. Think I think it's great too for the, just the discipline side of it. Oh yeah, because I I don't do it much anymore, but I used to do like twenty four hour fast like once a one time a week. I'd always do it on Wednesday. I'd always do it on Wednesdays. Um, and just the discipline fact of it is like you're telling yourself, no, I'm not going to eat. Okay. And then if you can exercise that willpower and that discipline, then, then that transfers over to when the days when you can eat and you're like looking at that cupcake, you're looking at that, those donuts and be like, Hey, I just did 24 hours without eating. I can get away with not eating that thing. Mm. Um, I think that exercise of, of discipline and willpower that fasting does provide. I think that's, to me, that's the other benefit of it is just that the discipline side of it um, and realizing like, I don't need that. I can get, you know, I don't, I don't want to have that. I don't want to feel like that. I don't need it. So it makes you think too. You start, you start realizing like, because when you fast, I don't know how it is for you, but I know for me, I feel I, I need to sleep less. Mm -hmm. I'm less tired. I'm more focused. I'm hungry. I'm really hungry. I may be a little moody. <laughs> But I, but I'm better at working, and it, when I started doing it, it reset my mind. It made me look at food as fuel again, mm. and not just mouth pleasure, right? It was, <laughs> it, was, it was like, oh yeah, if I eat the if I eat these tomatoes with my breakfast and broccoli, you know that makes me feel better. So you start paying attention to that too, not just in the moment, but like how how certain foods make you feel afterwards mm -hmm. yeah to me that's like the biggest kind of test that you can do with the food is you can eat it and like taste great at the time but how do you feel afterwards like, do you have energy 
do you just want to sit on the couch after you ate that or do you want to like go up and you know do a bunch of yard work or something like that does it give you that energy or does it take away so i um, describe it as clean mm. right certain meals i feel clean and certain certain meals i don't clean like i have a smoothie every day now i like have to if i don't have this like this like protein powder like the certain smoothie style that i do at like post lunch every day i i don't feel good yeah and if, if you know that that's what makes you feel good then you know that's what you should do so let's go we just that was a nice segue off into the meals but i mean it's a super important thing to talk about especially right now if you're eating a but if you have a bunch of sugar let's think about this too like i have i have friends that are immune compromised right i'm sure you do as well we're all americans mm -hmm. um if you have like a breathing complication if you're older if you are uh susceptible to the virus and you eat like crap right that makes you that severely hampers your body's ability to fight off um infections and it's also yeah. normal flu season. So if you get sick and then you're get COVID on top of being sick and you're unhealthy and you're eating unhealthy, you're going to have a, you're going to have a real bad time. Absolutely. Should really like sugars that give you an insulin spike. Actually, what was it? I was reading somewhere that your body, like when you get a viral infection, your body doesn't want to eat. Mm. Right. You get sick. So it drives down your glucose and it helps your body fight the virus. But if you have a bacterial infection, like a cold, then you do want to eat. Your body wants that glucose. It helps you fight differently. So maybe if you're feeling a little sick and it's flu season, you should try fasting for all the reasons that we discussed. And also it might help you feel better and fight this fight this infection. Yeah. I and mean, what's the, this is a, the old like wives tale. Like was it starve a cold, feed a fever, or, I don't know, or drown a cold or whatever it is. It just made me think of that drown a cold, starve a fever, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Let's go back to uh, training right now. Everybody's buying training stuff, right? Everybody's buying home fitness equipment. So Sam, in, in your mind, what are, if I was to go out and spend money on home fitness equipment, what's hype and what is essential? Like what should I what should I have in my home gym for quarantine fitness? I think um, a pull-up bar. Uh, I literally, I mean, I own a gym and I, I used to have a pull-up bar in my old house. When we moved to a new house, I had to take it down. But I literally have one of these, the doorway pull-up things that you put into the doorway hooks in there. I, I think I've had that since... 2008 or something like that i've had it forever and it's just like somehow it made the move with us multiple times but i've been using that thing like crazy um and it works just fine for me uh i think a set of like some people use trx straps but i think another easy way is a set of rings mm -hmm. um you can do tons of things with rings if you can't do pull-ups then you can do ring rows um you can do push-ups on those you can do dips on those uh, you can just, you can do all kinds of crazy things with rings. Um, and I have a set of rings that I bought and I just have some cheap like cargo straps that I use. And I literally loop those through the pull-up bar that I have that hooks onto my doorway. I was just doing pull-ups and ring rows today with it. Um, so I think pull-up bar ring rows or rings that you can use on there. Um, a kettlebell or a dumbbell. Like honestly, one of those, you're, you can do a ton of stuff. With kind of a medium sized um medium to medium heavy dumbbell what's um, what's medium heavy like it, it, i mean that's a really that's a kind of a personal dependent upon the uh, your strength but i think anywhere from like 30 to 50 pounds if you have one in there um most people can kind of do a lot of things with that dumbbell same thing with a kettlebell um if you have a pull up bar a set of rings and a kettlebell you can do a ton of stuff uh, and ton of horizontal movements, a ton of transverse movements, just all kinds of different things you can do with that. So um, I think if I was going to start like a home gym like that, I'd get a pull-up bar, I'd get a ring, I'd get a set of rings, and I'd get a kettlebell. And eventually, if you want to get a, um, a barbell, 
by all means get one, but you definitely don't have to spend. Um, That's pricey. For, yeah. You, for a kettlebell set of rings and a pull-up bar, you're going to spend maybe 150 bucks and you can do a ton of stuff with those three things. Yeah. All your, everything that we talked about, you'd be able to do. Mm -hmm. I the used rings to have... are great because you can use those in the, as an assistance. So like if you can't do a pistol, you can hold on to the rings, sit back and it will help you do the pistol. Um, it'll help you with the pull-ups. You can do push-ups from those um, uh, kind of at an um, elevated incline position if you can't do push-ups on your own on the floor. Um, so there's just a, you know, a ton of different things you can do with a set of rings. Yeah. I have these $40 ones. So they were some of the top sellers on Amazon. They're like the wood ones with black straps. Mm. They're perfect. They're, they're like 40 bucks. The uh, cheaper ones were made out of plastic. These ones were made out of this nice wood. And I thought they looked nice in the gym. So I was like, oh, I'll just pay an extra like $15 or whatever. But they're great. I have no complaints. They're, they are perform awesome. So yeah. uh, bands, you, ever, you try bands. You have bands? Yeah, I think bands are great. Um, it's another way to um, provide assistance as if you're going to do pull-ups. Um, you can do pull-ups that way. You can even use bands to help you do push-ups if you um, uh, strap the band to something and you put your body weight on top of it. It will help lift you up. But then you can also use it for the resistance side of it where you can do push-ups on a band where it's resisting you. Or you can do squats standing in a band where it's resisting you. Um, there's just you can do a ton of things with it. I think honestly bands is one of the things that's been um, that I've seen kind of underutilized at the gym because we've been renting out equipment, renting, we're giving equipment to away, away to our members so they can use. But that's the one thing nobody's asked for. I'm like, I've got a couple of sets of bands at home that you can just do a ton of stuff. Yeah. They can assist you with pull-ups. Yep. Right. I did that yep. at your gym. I've done band assisted pull-ups and like go up there and crank out like 30 and then you get the noodle arms. You're like, Man, that was a lot of pull-ups, but <laughs> that's a heck of a pump, man. Yeah, it is. So yeah. Uh, bands, those are all cool. Let's talk about rocking. Mm. Right. My, my thing, your thing too. You like rocking. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I do. So, and rocking now is the time to rock. You can rock in quarantine. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you can't rock with a friend, but <laughs> you could oh, you guys yoke, gotta keep a good separation. Yeah. You get yoked you. up if you do that, but yeah. you can, you can go rocking. Um, I, this is something I wanted to talk about for a little while actually is like the benefits of rocking versus running. And you and I have talked, touched a little bit on it. Rocking takes a long time to train. Yes. That's a downside. Yes. Yeah. It soaks up a lot of time. Um, most civilian rocking events are centered around like 35 pounds, 25 pounds, um, which is pretty light considering its origins, which are in the military guys going out on ops and carrying weight 25, 35 pounds is pr really light. If you look at stories of guys like from Vietnam, like right? we're bigger than we ever used to be as Americans. Guys in Vietnam, 160 pound dudes are going out into the into the bush and they're carrying a thousand rounds of 762 for the M60 in an Alice pack. And that thing weighs a hundred pounds. And they're doing multi-day ops. Yeah, Granted, in terrain. Yeah. It like slugging it out in the highlands. Yeah. Right. So you could do it. And you don't have to be big to do it. It is possible, but you have to train right to do it. So the downside is it takes a lot of time. It takes a little bit of equipment, more equipment than you need for running. But what are some of the what are some of the benefits? In my opinion, if you want to get strong, if you want to do strong movements, you'll get far greater benefit from <laughs> you'll get far greater benefit from rocking than you would from running. Yeah, I think uh, it's um, obviously if, you know, impact is a um, big part of running. And a lot of people, as they get older, um, that impact on their knees, their ankles, their hips, and their back um, can be a reason that people don't run or won't exercise because the doctor tells them they can't. So rucking is a little bit more of a form of, a, I would say, lower impact um, at certain weights. Uh, heavier weights you get, you're going to add more stress to the body. But... Um, you know, in that 25 to 35 pound 
kind of area, that's, that's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote a little program for, um, a bunch of people. It's kind of an intro into rucking and it started light and it started short and you just slowly kind of add weight on there. And then slowly add a little bit of distance, but then you have speed days and then you have days, you know, longer, heavier days. But yeah, I think there's a lot of great benefits to it. Back strength, leg strength, it's low impact. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great to get outdoors and do it in some terrain and do it on a trail or, you know, do it in some kind of hilly areas. Um, it can be uh, more fun in that sense rather than having to, to stare on a treadmill or stare at a TV screen as you're running or, um, you know, doing that inside a gym. It gets you outside. It's much more enjoyable, I would say. Rucking, try it out. If you like it, could be a great alternative to you for running. I think running is boring, yet something I have to do. Um, I like rucking better. I think, I feel like rucking makes me stronger. Yeah. I mean, it's putting that load on your body. Um, running will make you stronger to a certain extent, but yeah, putting that load on and having to bear that load and move it. I mean, your back's going to get stronger. Your glutes and your hamstrings are going to get stronger. So yeah, there's definitely that, that side of rucking where it's more of, could be more of a strength building exercise than say running. Yeah. And if you guys are looking for resources available for rucking, um, Sam just talked about it. he's got a training plan, a nice intro for rucking. I probably will also do a video at some point about some of my methodology and my thoughts. Um, I think Sam is definitely going to be more refined. So I'm just really going to talk about my findings in my training and some of my things. Yeah, well, you've, you've discovered a lot, obviously, over the, the times you've been rucking. So that's mm. experience right there. And you can't replace that. Yep. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do some more stuff for that in the future, put out some good content for that. Um, and I think you and I, once we're allowed to like be friends and be around each other without being <laughs> fined a thousand dollars by the governor, uh, we will, we'll do some collab, yeah. uh, research and find some good stuff for, um, heavyweight long distance rucking. All right, cool. You have any other topics you would like to go into for as far as like quarantine fitness or talking about fitness in general? Um, I guess, you know, we talked a little bit about running. I, like, I, I think running is a, a great thing. Um, like anything you could do too much of it. And I think for some people, um, you know, running is great, but some pe- times when people are training for certain things, training for, you know, a half marathon or a marathon, um, they can kind of overtrain that kind of side. And uh, I think that's where it leads to a lot of injuries. And I think it's interesting too with running, maybe they should do with rucking too. Um, There's technique to running. So just like anything, if you're going to teach somebody how to do a pull up or a push up, or you're going to teach them how to do a deadlift, there's technique to it. And I think it's just funny with running. It's like one of those things like, just go run. It's like, okay, well, how do I run? Well, just run, you know? Um, it's one of those things that people don't spend enough time on the skill and practicing running and, and good form with running. And then when it comes to that other part of it is, you know, getting good form and running, there's a lot of other things that you can do like rocking that um, make you a better runner without actually having to run. Um, and CrossFit's obviously kind of goes along with that. We run in workouts, but doing workouts where you're not running and you're getting your heart rate up and you're, you're doing, you know, um, difficult things and you're breathing heavy, that will have a positive side and a positive uh, reflection in your running. You will be better at running. The stronger your back is, the stronger your upper body is, the stronger your lungs are. So with running, it's a great exercise. And right now, obviously, it's one of the things that everybody can do. But I really would, uh, I'd like to see more people get into the actual side of being better at running and, and trying to practice the skill of running. Yeah. The skill of running. That's important. I've, I've, I forgot who it was, but somebody gave, said the analogy that fitness is a skill, right? Uh, Maybe it was Mark Ripito, somebody, Mm -hmm. one of those lifting gurus. He was talking about uh, lifting as a skill, like your deadlift, your bench press is skill. And as you get better at it, your skill in it gets better. And it's just, I think that's the same for like all movements, all forms of exercising. Your running is a skill. There's a lot of little skills that go into it. Same with rucking. 
Same with a lot, of, a lot of your CrossFit stuff. I'm sure that not only is it just raw fitness, but there's skill in like doing a Murph. When do you exert yourself? When do you hold back, mm. you know, all your proper form, things like that. Um, so, yeah, the skill of running is just yeah, as important think, as just getting better, too. Yeah. And it will help you get better. And then, you know, the other part of that is like not doing the mindless miles that people think they have to do. Um, to prepare for something. And a lot of people, I think the miles come into more of a mental side of it. If somebody knows they're going to have to run a half marathon, math, half marathon, so they have to run whatever, 13 some miles, they want to know they can run 13 miles before they can run 13 miles. So it's like, yeah, you're going to do two miles the first week, then four, and then six, and then eight, and then all the way up to you can do 13. It's like, well, why should you run 13 before you're running 13 on the race day? Like, for most people, I believe it's the mental side of it is they want to know they can do it before they have to do it, which is, you know, it's understandable. But if you're trying to bench 315, you can't just go bench 315 before you bench 315. You can't. Mm. So you have to work up to that and you have to build up to it by not just benching. There's lots of other things that you need to do to be able to get that bench where you want it. So I feel like with running, it's kind of like, it's just like, you know, I'm just going to go run. I'm going to run. I'm going to run. I'm going to run more. I'm going to run more. It's like, well, why don't you go to other things that will help you run and will help you be a better runner without actually putting you in that position to get hurt. Yeah. I fully agree. You, that's a very good point. That's a very good, like you can or cannot bench press 300 pounds, right? That's a physical thing you can or cannot do. Mm -hmm. um, most people, of moderate, at least physical fitness can run a marathon. And this is why I think this, because when I did a marathon once, I hate running by the way, <laughs> but I did a marathon before I did the Madison marathon. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, I did this, like, I didn't just go straight home. Um, I did a road trip across the country in my nice. Volkswagen Jetta. Yeah, it was awesome. I packed up everything that I owned and threw it in my Jenna and I went across the country and I visited a bunch of old war buddies and eventually I ended up in California, not with a war buddy, but I stayed in this like surfer boarding house for business executives, Airbnb. Nice. And I, and I was talking to a buddy of mine in Madison he signed up for the Madison marathon. He's like, you want to do it? I said, yes. Yeah. So I had like eight weeks to train. So I was occasionally when I wasn't partying, I was going, <laughs> I was doing occasional runs and these runs started off at like six miles. And I think the longest one that I did was 14 miles in California, just in SoCal along the coast. Beautiful. Yeah. But I was, I had no training, no methodology. I had no timings, no recordings. I had nothing. I was just, I was just doing what I wanted, just occasionally running. I go to Madison and then, um, the morning of the race, I remember I pulled out my running shoes and I look and the insoles are gone. I took the insoles and I had them in like my boots or something or like another pair of shoes somewhere that I didn't have with me. I'm like, no. So my buddy hands gets the insoles from his vans, his vans <laughs> shoes. And they're like little pieces of floppy cardboard. So we put those in there and I go to the race and I run. I'm awful. Everybody at the marathon is more prepared than me. And I mean like everybody I'm like, so I'm doing the run and I have everybody blows past me. And then like a dude goes past me and he has a shirt on that says I have cancer and I'm in front of you. <laughs> right. And then this like, thanks dude. Yeah. And then this like 80 year old woman passes me and then there's this dude, he's a power walker and he power walks past me. So I'm, <laughs> I am jogging. I am jogging, but I did the whole marathon. Awesome. I did the whole marathon and there were other people that did the marathon about the same time I did a really long time. Took me forever, but I did do it. So I think there's this perception of like that super great distance is like this far reaching goal. Well, it's really not. If you have moderate fitness, you can run a marathon. The real question is, is like what time yes. can I run a marathon in? Cause I could not run, um, you know, you know, seven minute miles. For that marathon Jeez, yeah. could not i couldn't do it but i could run the marathon so when you set these goals in your mind and you want to train for them and i think we talked about this in the last time you were on have a plan 
stick to the plan. The plan needs to be made by somebody that knows what they're doing and it needs to be, have good goal orientation, having this strange goal that of like, I just want to be able to do this thing. You need to narrow it down more. I want to be able to do this thing in this time. I want to be able to bench press this much weight in this much time. I want to be able to do this many pushups in this much time. You got to narrow down those goals and make them more specific so you can train appropriately. Otherwise, you're either going to undertrain and not make your goal, or you're just going to hinder yourself. Yeah, yeah. They have to be specific enough so you can be able to attain them. It's just some, you know, like you said, it's just some broad goal. Then you know you have no way to shoot for that because it's just a wide open kind of thing. Yeah. Aim small, miss small, huh? Aim small, miss small. Yeah. And if you stick to the plan, you're going to make it. Yeah, eventually you will. I mean, yeah. you'll get there. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny, like how you said that. Like, I think, especially, you know, like you said, most people, and I'm, I believe the same thing, most people that are decently fit could run 26.2 miles or whatever it is. For most people, it's the mental barrier. But obviously, I think you being a vet, being, uh, uh, you know, in the Marines, multiple deployments and stuff like that, you have a different, um, uh, mental capacity or mental fitness that other people just don't have because they haven't been pushed to that limit or they haven't done things that they didn't think they could do, which maybe this running the marathon is that thing. Um, that well, I'll just say for better or worse, right? You know, the Marine Corps taught me like, hey, here's your obstacle and I, you just headbutt your way through it and then like rage out and uh, well, there was a door handle. Perhaps I could have just opened the door, <laughs> you know, it's, yep. uh, which is exactly what happened with like the training and the marathon thing. So, but pain is a great teacher. I think I learned a lot. I would, I would much rather like now identify somebody to learn from and get yes. a good plan and have a good structured plan. Uh, that would be far better than just raging your way through it. Cause I tell you what, dude, like doing that marathon, like, yeah, I did it, but I could have hurt myself. Like I kind of oh, yeah. jacked up my knees my hips for a long time yep so we did not do another one again check that off the list yep i did my marathon check that off the list now i'm just gonna do horrible things that are different and that i enjoy yeah. like yes. rocking yes yeah <laughs> it's i might do another marathon maybe at some point in the future i'll want to revisit it because and do better like actually do a time yeah that would be something compare it to you know i think so yeah I don't know. I might fall down the rabbit hole of endurance, endurance events like some people do. Some people that do these crazy 24 hour long challenges. Right, Sam? It happens. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. What was the one you were going to do? A rope climb? Yeah, I was thinking about doing that. This the uh, COVID Corona thing kind of threw a monkey wrench into it. So I was trying to see if I could do like 24 hours, um, as many rope climbs that I could do um, in 24 hours. But I don't know when it's going to happen now because I want to do it this summer, but I don't know about getting groups of people together and when that would be able to happen. Mm. And the more I trade for it, you know what? Rope climbs are really boring. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, you know, I've done a bunch. And then like I, when I started wanting to do that, I started training a couple of times a week doing rope climbs. And dude, it was like legit boring because <laughs> you stand in the same place you go up you come back down there's like no movement like at least with like rucking like you're moving you're going they're like there's different scenery you're, you're passing things like the Murph thing i did i mean there was a lot of repetition with that but at least there was like there was some differentiation of like doing or running a little bit and then doing pull-ups and push-ups like man that was more like gonna be a mental battle of just like <laughs> literally just like you said just you know, just banging your head against it. Just yeah. Like just boom. hour 14. You're like, man, this is dumb. <laughs> I know I, I did it. Like I did some extended, like not even, I mean, I did stuff like a half an hour of rope climbs and I was like, Holy crap, this is really boring, mm. really boring, but we'll see. Mm. Unlike the 24 hour Murph you did, which is probably a lot more interesting. It was, honestly, it was. Cause then, you know, like some people would like do it alongside you, which I didn't really care, but they, people would do it with you and you know, it was fun, but at least there was like some breaking up of the monotony, but literally if you climb on rope for that one, well, you're just climbing the rope. You're I'm going wanted, up and coming down, going up, coming down. Uh, 
I want to do these like, so I got some buddies of mine, uh, they're in the na- local national guard sniper section and they'll go to these competitions where they do sniper stuff. So it's like super physical. They have lawn rocks, they have obstacle courses, they have so- all sorts of crazy things they got to do. And then they got to do shoots. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm like, I really like this idea of like finding physical events that are also mental. Like you test your mental skills as long as well as getting smoked. Uh, that's, that's really really interests me but it's very specific a lot of that is military i mean there's probably yeah the firefighting community they have like a fitness competition thing don't they yeah they've got a couple different um little different ones they do some of them are almost like team events and some of them are like um single events you thought about doing um, that i had thought about doing that i watched one of the competitions i did a um three or four years ago i did a crossfit competition that was nothing but firefighters um, which was a cool experience. Um, and then at that event, it was a whole huge fire event thing in Indianapolis. Uh, and then there was that, that firefighter competition thing, which is really cool. Like it's, it's kind of very sprinty. Um, it was like climbing up stairs, dragging stuff up, like going through things. So it could be a team event where there's like legs of it you do, or you could do it individual. Um, it looked pretty interesting. Like some of those dudes were, um, uh, in good shape. Yeah, they do have to do like the sledgehammer thing where they have that block of steel and they have to sledgehammer it. Yeah. And what else do they do? Oh, they do the rope pull or like the, yeah. what is it? the hose pull. Mm-hmm. Yep. You pull, you like climb up the thing, you got to pull the hose up all the way or something like that. It's a smoker. Like yeah. doing that stuff, your grip and, you know, carrying stuff and like your, your grip and your pull um, get taxed pretty quick. Do you do I, rope? I like that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you do rope training? Like, the battle rope stuff you do that stuff i don't i i have i don't do it very often um i'll do with like a battle rope i'll do like pulling stuff with it like i'll hook it to a prowler sled and then i'll pull the prowler sled to me and then i'll push it pull it push it um stuff like that um was mostly what i would use the battle ropes for what's the next fitness exercise or the next fitness thing that you want to try out. You're like, look at it. You're like, Oh, that's interesting. I want to try that. What's the next thing that Sam wants to try out? You know, I wanted to be the, the rope climb thing. That was going to be the next thing, but I think I want to do like the ruck thing now. Um, I originally had the idea with the rope climb thing. We kind of talked about it, but I, that was kind of keep it under my hat for a while that I wanted to do a 24 hour ruck um, and see how far I could get in 24 hours and then have people just do it along with me if they want to. Um, I'll do it with you. But, I know, I know yeah. you. Know. Um, so that's kind of the next thing I was, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do, um, and uh, yeah, just kind of a fun twenty-four hour event. See what you can do, see how long you can go, see how far you can go. I've never done like a twenty-four hour. I've done twenty-four hour movements, but they're always in like training. I've never done, and and so your mind is busy because you're like working, right? Like you're mm-hmm. like doing stuff. Uh, but I've never done a 24 hour movement for like an event where you're just moving. There's nothing else on your mind. It's a lot easier when you have other stuff on your mind and other yeah. things that are stressing you out. I don't want to say easier, but it is like the actual physical event itself is easier when you have a lot of other things going on. Like if you're doing a military job or something, mm-hmm. um, but j- yeah, just like 24 hour ruck be awful i bet you get delirious you know like you like super sleepy and delirious You'd yeah i'm sure there'd be long. a point where you would just yeah that'd be I, awesome <laughs> <laughs> i haven't i think the i guess the longest i've ever gone ice like baton yeah we did about a 30 mile rock when i was in um so that's the longest i've ever done so i, I don't know what happens after that distance mm. oh you're <laughs> Oh, the feet the yeah. back. Well, I, and maybe we'll do another video after we collab. We could put some information out there. I already have a lot of thoughts, but I want to verify a lot of stuff before I put it out into the public and be like, yeah, here's some, some things that I learned. Um, but abrasion is a really big deal with rucking. Like you have to learn how to mitigate it and eventually your skin just has to adapt to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's abrasion, um, there's cartilage, tendons, all that stuff. Uh, plays a bigger deal than it does in running, and it takes long. And that's the other thing, running or 
in comparison to lifting, it takes longer to adapt to running or rucking. Sorry. It takes longer to yeah. adapt to rucking because your ligaments, your tendons, your cartilage, your skin takes longer to adapt than muscle does. So your training takes long, not longer in like training session, but like longer in length of time of training at that, at that stage, in my opinion, to do it no. properly. Unlike the military. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. With that too. I mean, you've got different loads, you got different distances. Um, kind of each has their own little specific differences that make it more challenging. Um, yeah. We talked about this too. It was like the load that, you know, you get to a certain point and I really think, I think like 40 pounds is kind of like, I think that's the sweet spot uh, for like what humans can kind of like carry. Cause I've been researching a lot and there's a book by uh, Peter Blaber. Um, the man, I know the mission, the men and me, anyways, a guy from Delta force. Um, and they've got the long March thing that they do in selection, which the last March is like 40 some miles through West Virginia. And I think they're carrying around 70 pounds, um, in that, uh, but he, in the book, him and a bunch of guys were doing some extra training and they were going over the part of the Rockies. Um, and they had found that like 40 pounds was kind of that sweet spot um, for kind of the, the best amount of weight that you can carry that keeps you going like long distances um, and sustainable. Um, obviously, there's, you know, people that carry more for longer, but that seems to be kind of the sweet spot. And I think most like... If you look at most military events, maybe you can speak more to like the Marine Corps. I don't like for you guys crucible, like how much would you guys be rocking? Like uh, how much weight would you have? That's a good question. You got your full kit. You got, I think you have the training sappies, which are like lighter weight than real sappies in the old body armor. Uh, so that's probably like 20. You probably have about 50 to 60 pounds in gear. It's not like your full combat load, but it's pretty heavy for a somebody that's brand new to that operational environment, man, I don't even know what the distance is either. I just remember it was like three days of like not eating and not sleeping. And like, just by that point, you're such a broken robot from yeah. just boot camp. Anyway, you're just like, you've learned completely learned to like, de uh, uh, de associate yourself and be in a, like I'm rocking, but in my mind, I'm like in a park somewhere eating a burger. <laughs> I'm there, but I'm not really off. there. Yeah. Yeah. So you I just... think that too, like the, uh, um, I think the, like the para, um, parachute regiment, the British one, I think their ending little event they do is like a 10 miler. And I think they have like 35 to 40 pounds. Um, oh, so you gotta little... be hauling. Yeah. The Royal Marines, they have a, they're 30, they have a 30 miler. That's their ending kind of thing for training. And I think they're around like 35, 40 pounds too. I think um, the 35, 45 pound thing, that's like a load you can run in. Not recommended. Should yeah. run with a ruck on super bad for your knees, but the military doesn't care. They may, they do it anyway. But uh, you, you could like haul if yeah. you needed to, you could run uh, with 35, 40 pounds. I know when I did my sniper and doc, so I'm not that cool of a guy when I was in the national guard I tried out for the snipers in my like my last year and I didn't make it, but I didn't stay long enough to go to school or to learn anything, you know, or to become super proficient in the skill set. But I was fortunate to be around some studs um, and uh, watch their character and learn from them for a short period of time. But I did do the induct and I did get selected. I don't know why, because I didn't do that good in the induct, <laughs> but I <laughs> survival. So now he's gonna finish. <laughs> yeah. When I did that. I had to do, I think it was, I don't know how far it was. I think it was 12 miles. I do 12 mile ruck run. Um, and it was pretty heavy and I had the 50 cal with me, but when I would run, cause it was unknown distance for time and I would run distances. So I'd pick like a, a, a landmark and I would run to that and then I would walk and then I'd pick another one and I'd run to that and I'd walk, uh, which is, so you do this like hybrid ruck, ruck run. And that was at a heavier load. But you're not like really running. You just look like yeah, you're running. It just feels good sometimes. It feels good not to be able to like stretching out your legs, rucking. I think like I think that's why the little jog feels better sometimes because it's just different. 
Yeah. Different muscles. Also, I had dudes like following me in a car, like harassing me the whole time. That's the way it should be. I think. (laughs) Like, why aren't you running? So you start running, you're going the same speed, but Uh, you look like you're running, you know? (laughs) Yeah. You need that proper set of motivation. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think it's like that 35 to 40 pounds seems like that's kind of like that money. Just you, you can run with it. And then also like terrain dependent, you know, like if you're doing hills and, you're on a trail, you're probably not going to be running, but if you're on a road, yeah, you can, you can jog it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Off-roading with rocks. Yeah. Holes. Yeah. Yeah, You're not going to be running then. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the, the equalizer sometimes when it comes to the weights, maybe the, the distance and the terrain. Um, And the purpose. mm -hmm. You're just trying to pass in doc or are you trying to work out? You trying to get better. If you're yeah. trying to get better and you're trying to get in shape, you don't want to run with a ruck. So you <laughs> damage your knees. It will crush you um, if you do that long term. But if you just got to do a little in doc, you got to do this like little military fitness test as competition, you'll be all right. You just do yeah. that one and done. You get it done. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's awesome. Let's see. I. Yeah. Sam, thanks for coming back on. I always appreciate you coming on to the podcast, man. You're such a, you're, cause you're a really great resource of information. So I appreciate your time. No, thanks for coming on. I, I love to having the conversation. I love talking to you and, and getting your side of the, the story too. You got a yeah. lot of information and I learned just as much from you. Ah, thank you. Appreciate that. And uh, Sam has agreed to come on occasionally. If you guys have any questions, you would like, to uh you would like us to address um on another podcast episode hit us up shoot us a message uh instagram facebook uh you can hit up crossfit gr and uh we'll bring them up we'll bring them up we'll talk about it maybe that's what we should do we should do a q a session in the next one awesome man Love all right to. very cool and uh so let's go into into the other part. So Sam, where can people go if they want to learn more about you and about CrossFit GR? Yeah, you can go to uh, get on the interwebs at www.crossfitgr.com. Um, I also have a little side thing I've been doing for the uh, kind of military, law enforcement, and firefighters. Uh, I've started to um, put some plans together for people trying to pass schools or to go to uh, basic training or just get into an academy. So that's um, stronger, faster, powerful, tactical, um, but it's just sfptactical.com. You can go on there and we put some resources and, and some, I got some, some free sample plans in there. That Ruck March one we mentioned is in there. And then some other kind of tactical plans uh, that people can get for free if they like it. Look what we got and if it's something you want. Um, Go ahead and get it. Very cool. And if you want some supplements, we got crookindustries.com. We got, hey, what you got there? I got the, uh, I had a little little hitter of this, the uh, pre-workout. I worked out before we came on here, but I had a little left over. So it was oh. a good little boost to keep me through the conversation. Yeah, the pre-workout's good stuff, man. Because it's, uh, sometimes you have to get pump and pre-workout separate but this has a uh, pump in it. So that's a good combo. And it's got no, I liked little... it. I, I used it, what was it on Monday and I had to do some stuff and it didn't make me jittery. It didn't make me like crash. Um, I got a little boost from it, but it wasn't like too much. I think for me, that's you get into some of that pre-workout stuff and it's too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a great blend. I really like it. It's smooth and it tastes great too. Um, so yeah, check it out. And then I also, the big thing that I've been using is sleep bomb. So this is my sleep aid, right? So, uh, like I said, I'm working at the hospital part-time, but, and I work a 12 hour night shift and, uh, sometimes it's hard to swap sleep. I'm also an entrepreneur. And so sometimes I stay awake for hours on end thinking about whatever I'm thinking about. Well, our sleep aid, it's not like NyQuil, right? So NyQuil is just a whole buttload of melatonin. And it knocks you out, uh, but I like it's like forced, hard forcing yourself to go to sleep. It's not that good for your brain. It throws off your body's normal melatonin production because it's just too much melatonin. So what we have instead is this blend from these natural ingredients. Um, 
like lemon balm and hops and St. John's wort. So it does two things. There's a little bit of melatonin that helps you fall asleep, not too much to force you to sleep, but it helps you fall asleep. And it has this blend of stuff that helps, uh, helps you be less stressed out. It helps calm your mind. So those racing thoughts that stress you out and get your heart rate going, you're like, oh, I got to do that thing tomorrow. I can't believe I said that today. It calms that down. So you're able to lay there and you're able to like drift into a nice, deep, very focused sleep, um, which is great. But you also get a better recovery sleep too when you're less stressed out. Yeah, that's, I mean, a huge part of recovery when it comes to sleep is getting good quality sleep. Um, I think like NyQuil and all those other ones you can take like that, it's not a good quality sleep. It's like, like you said, it's like knocking you out. Yeah, it makes you drowsy too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not with this stuff, I don't get drowsy. I don't take it. Like even on days that I can't, I feel like I'll be able to sleep well, I still take it because I want to get the best possible sleep that I can. So awesome. And also uh, coffee. So check out scars and stripes, coffee.com um, coffee subscriptions available. And with the code crook, all the proceeds from that go directly to the podcast and improving my production quality for the podcast. Some things I want to get are some better cameras. I want to get some sweet cameras, like some nice Canon ones. So that's a, that's a goal for the podcast, especially by the time that I start interviewing people in person, you know, in like the next month, uh, cause we're not allowed to do it this month. Um, then, That'd be really cool. We'll have to have you over, Sam, so we can we don't have to do this online. Gotta see thing. the studio. Now you gotta, yeah, you gotta check out the studio. Um, and then if you want to help veterans and first responders, a great place to do that is Hero Raise, HeroRaise.com. Hero Raise is a crowdfunding platform uh to help veterans and first responders get the resources they need for them and their families. It could be medical. It could be, uh, you know, uh, psychological help, counseling, uh, PTSD therapy. It can be even helping a family pay an auto mechanic bill. There's all sorts of things on there. And there's good nonprofits on there as well that also uh, can use fundraising. So Hero Raise validates uh, the provider, the medical or provider, whatever, whoever's rendering that service. And they also validate the hero unlike some other crowdfunding platforms uh, who run scams. Hero Raise, through their verification process, ensures that there are no scams and the money goes straight to the provider. It can't be like pocketed by anybody. So if you want to help somebody, that is a good, safe way to help out America's heroes. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.